to read to you the um, story of Ezekiel's vision of the Valley of the Dry Bones from Ezekiel 37, beginning at verse 1. And the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. And he caused me to pass among them round about, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said to me, Prophesy over these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, that you may come to life. And I will put sinews on you, and make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you, that you may come alive, and you will know that I am the Lord." So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, sinews were on them, and flesh grew, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they come to life. So I prophesied, as he commanded me. And the breath came into them, and they came to life, and stood on their feet, an exceeding great army. Big difference here between an illustration and a vision. An illustration is sort of thing you had a few weeks ago when I said, when I said to you out there, those of you who were there, I said, uh, just because we don't believe God's laws doesn't mean it's not dangerous if we if we disobey them. And it's a bit like having a traffic cone. Just because you can move the cone doesn't mean it's not dangerous beyond it. That's an illustration. I want to teach you something, and here is an illustration. A parable is also teaching, but tends to be the other way around. So Sarah went forth to see the kingdom of God is like this. Jesus uses parables frequently to teach something. And there's a strength in the parable, which is more than just the, the teaching, if you like, the explanation. A vision is, is, a, is a move beyond that. A vision is a picture, or as in this, a complete um, small drama, which comes to you before the meaning and sometimes with visions there is no explication but clearly although if you read on in 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 Ezekiel there is an extension and there is an explanation about it what it means this is Israel being resurrected and what have you clearly the vision comes before it and the vision is stronger and the vision will stand on its own otherwise God could have just told them what he told them in the explanation with a vision, you, you, you need to get into it. You need to see it. You need to feel it. I cannot say to you, oh, and no, I just want to talk to you for a few moments about bones. You know, that just doesn't work, does it? And it, you may have heard clever sermons that say the first part of this is for evangelicals. Hear the word and get your act together. The second is for Pentecostals, but you're nowhere until the breath comes into you. It's not about that. It is seeing it. And any of you who've done Ignatian uh, meditation will know that if you, if you read these passages, you need to actually sit in them, stand in them, walk in them, and hear the word of God. And in some ways, then go home, although I will comment before you go home. But essentially, just hear it, you know, just feel it, just see it, to smell it in this case, I wonder. So we could try that. If you want to try that this morning, we'll just, just, just two minutes, we'll just run through that vision. And if you want to close your eyes, that's a good, you know, a good, good way of doing that. I'll close my eyes so I won't know if you're closing yours or not. But just want you to picture this because if you hear it and just feel it, you'll have got most of it. So if you want to close your eyes, just think. I just want you to think um, that we're on a, on a, on a semi-desert valley. I just... It's, it's that typical sort of semi-desert Mediterranean. It's grey, brown, beige, dirt. 
and there's a bit of scrub and a few thorns and a few thistles and bits and pieces and you're standing on some stones and pebbles and because this is BC you're wearing sandals and it's very, very hot. And uh, you walk, you just want to walk forwards across this low valley in the heat and there's a bit of dust and there's stones. But as you look ahead, you realise that actually there are lots and lots of bones. And they're all over the place. And, you, and they're long bones and little bones and skulls over here and there. And they make no sense. Look around, just like looking on a beach covered in large seashells. And you scrunch them and you bump into them and just, you can feel them and... Uh, and it adds to the heat of deadness. And as God says, just look around. What a mess. What a graveyard. And then there is some extraordinary movement. And these bones, and it is scary, these bones begin to agitate and move. Uh, and, and immediately the dust rises. Immediately where they are, it just dust and movement and rattling. And you find they're not just rattling, but look, and they are, they are somehow coming together and skeletons are, are forming. And, and, and then there are skeletons and now there is flesh and... and just imagine this as you see and these these are beginning to be people now and the dust and the movement and the dirt and the heat and you can feel it welling up and then there's some some wind and the the the, the wind comes and you can the dust is all over you and the dust is moving and they begin to come to life and they begin to get up and they stir themselves and suddenly you are stood in the midst, not of a wilderness, but you are surrounded by big men in uniform, in armor, and they're clanking and they're forming lines. And as the dust begins to settle, you are amazed. Okay, well, God sort of speaks in some way um, to us out of this kind of picture. And he says, it says in Ezekiel, this is a picture of what I will do with the people of, the people of Israel who are a dead loss. Who are shapeless, who are in bits, quite literally. This is what I will do with uh, my people who are literally dead. They have no strength, no form, and certainly no spiritual life. And he says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to shake them up and give them, give them back their form and organize them. And, uh, but I'm also going to give them muscle. I'm going to give them strength and give them life. I'll flesh them out as a people and I will put my spirit within them and make them right to life. This is not so much restoration as resurrection. And that is the word of the Lord to them. And it is to us in our scale. The word is where your life is in bits it's not all in bits, but bits of it are being bits. Where it is shapeless, where it is not holding together, where you feel there is no muscle, where you, you feel that there's no flesh to your life, no substance in your life at this point, I will put it there. I will give you strength. I will give you substance. I will give you form. And I will, above all, I will put my spirit within you. He says that to us this morning. That is very good news, radical news. He says that to you of yourself as an individual. He would say it about your relationships, maybe of your family, maybe of your peer group, maybe of pe people you work with, certainly of our community, and certainly at this moment, it is a word for our nation. You've only got to look at our political, social situation, and it's just a lot of bones all over the place. And so to hear this word is an encouraging word this morning. An unlikely but encouraging word. We need it. Our church needs it. A number of church meetings, not our church council, but church meetings I've been to, which are an examination of bones, is unbelievable. 
The number of set times I've been to religious events where the nearest life you had was shuffling around in the bones and making a slight bit of dust and saying, yes, something is happening. We need to hear this word. You need I need it. But from a vision, you need to be in it. Ezekiel enters into it. The grace we were talking about is the active presence of God. Unless we are involved with the active presence of God, it is not going to happen. It's just an inspiring picture to cheer us up. We need to be in it. It's interesting at the beginning of this passage that God takes Ezekiel all round the valley and makes him look at all the bones, almost gratuitously. And, and God led him round to show me how many there were. I said, why is he doing this? If you're going to be in part of this picture, if you're interested in, in being restored, then you've got to be in the picture at the beginning. Otherwise, it's a bit like going to the cinema and turning up halfway through the film. It just doesn't work. And when I, when I read this afresh, I thought, well, if I'm walking around this valley looking at these bones, I'm, I'm thinking, so where did they come from? How did they get here? That's extraordinary. What happened? And I will tell you that, by and large, they got there because they walked there. They didn't get dropped from the sky. They walked there. In, uh, in the Old Testament, uh, you get a variety of passages where Israel, because they're in the wrong place and do the wrong things and sin and make the wrong decisions, finish up in the wilderness you remember that they were promised the promised land and decided against it because they thought it was a bit challenging and thus spent another 40 years in the wilderness. We read in Numbers 14, 31. But as for you, he says, your carcasses shall be wasted in the wilderness. In other words, you will go round and round in the wilderness. You're not supposed to be there. You'll keep walking round in the wilderness till you die and your carcasses will be wasted and it says elsewhere and the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth will come and feast on them and no one will drive them away you get that in Jeremiah so the picture is there that the people of Israel are in this state because of their sin because of their disobedience how did they get here they walked there they made bad decisions they made wrong choices they disobeyed God they walked in the wrong path and they finished up in the wrong place and that's why they're in this mess. I was reading a, an article from a, an old magazine about the, the um, dangers of satnav. Now, this, is, this, is, this was music to my ears because I detest satnav, but there's some really sad things that happen with satnav. And this spoke of an American couple who uh, was coming down from Canada, actually, uh, into down, down the west uh, to Las Vegas, and they decided they'd take a, uh, a scenic route. <laughs> this is not good because they got lost, and then they turned on their sat-nav, and, um, and they, they came from Idaho and through to Nevada uh, in the night, and the road got smaller and smaller, and the fences got less and less, and they didn't realise it. But they just kept on following in the instructions. And as so often happens with Satnav, those instructions were absolutely wrong. And it took them out into the high mountain desert um, of Nevada. And in the morning, they realized that the track was running out. And they didn't know where they were. And he left her in the end with the car and he walked on. They found her couple of weeks later, just alive, they found his bones months later in the sand. How did he get there? By taking the wrong directions and the wrong instructions. We finish up in a mess, even in small messes in our lives, because we walked there. Because I made wrong decisions. I didn't believe what it said in the word of God. I had other sat -navs, friends' advice, the media, temptation. And I walked in the wrong way and finished up in the wrong place. 
think that that's what happens with us in our individual lives. It often happens within our relationships. Remember in uh, Lord of the Rings, just before the Battle of Helm's Deep, the, the king, just as they start the battle, says rather poignantly, how did it come to this? And you could have said to him, well, you should have just read the beginning of the book. <laughs> you know, you got yourself into this. And so we do. So does our nation. So does our church. If you track back to where we are in terms of lack of spirituality and lack of mission and lack of um, vitality, it will be a series of personal and corporate decisions that were badly made over decades. We walked. And certainly in my time and since the last world war, our nation has declined and fallen apart and become disparate and desperate because it made bad decisions that were not God decisions. Even now, those who would lead us are competing to tell us how liberal they are in their morals. So there's another step in the desert to come. In the whole of natural life, unless God is leading us, we will go astray. We will cease to be formed. And like the bones, we will fall apart. In science, we call it an increase in entropy. The whole thing comes to pieces, whether it's me or my relationships or my church or my community or my ecosystem or this planet. The whole thing comes to pieces unless God holds it together. And we are like boats. But it's not just a matter of um, circumstance leading to results. It's not just if you don't follow Jesus, life doesn't work out well. That is true. But you read in, in the Old Testament and you read in Ezekiel that God is not pleased and there is a sense of punishment in this. They got to the wrong place, but they didn't die of sunstroke. They were struck down. You read it in Numbers, God is angry with them because they do not believe him when he gives them the promised land. And so they are punished and so there is more to it than this. It's not just a matter of things going well, but God is displeased. We stand under God's wrath. I'm not, in, I'm not keen on wrath. But if we continue to disobey, we finish up in the wrong place and God is not pleased. I think we need to go into there because it leads us to a sense of repentance and into a good place to carry on in the story. Because carry on we do. You might think, well, Ezekiel's an Old Testament prophet. What happens? God does things and we watch. But actually... Ezekiel stays in the story and has an important part to play. God says to him, Ezekiel, can these bones live? And he says something so good. He says essentially, I don't know, <laughs> but you know. That is such a good answer. Because he's so honest about how bad they are and he says, I don't know. We need to be honest and humble in our in our in our whole assessment of where things are wrong in our lives otherwise we're either doing self-help and sorting ourselves out or we're doing church growth with by three key points or whatever it is we're like these archaeologists who turn up and find the bones and re reassemble them into skeletons and then wire them together and put them in museums or computer programs put you know like, like they put the flesh on them to show you what they used to look like we're like that. Can we put it together? No. I don't know, Lord. That's a good thing. When I pray with you, Lord, can you fill this building with your people to your glory? And I think to myself, I don't know. Only you know that, Lord. I think that's a good place to start. God knows. I couldn't. They're very dry. <laughs> I know it's myself. But then God says to Ezekiel, prophesy to these bones. Now, why does God say to him, prophesy to these bones? Why, God, why doesn't just God talk to the bones? Why throughout the Old Testament you get things like um, God, uh, you know, with Amos, and God showed me a plumb line, and he said to me, Amos, what do you see? And God said, uh, and Amos said, a plumb line, Lord. You feel that God's going to say, well done, Amos. 
But that's set. So why does he want it set? Because it's almost as though God wants to act in the world and chooses a human being to say it and do it as a portal. Almost as though the word needs to be said by the man in the desert, by the human being. And when it is said, it is appropriated. It is a channel, a channel of grace. Channels of grace are not sort of warm, sort of sentimental, emotional, sort of make me a channel of your peace sort of thing. Channels are portals where God's spirit breaks in and he chooses to use human beings to move the air and to move this and move that. In fact, what Ezekiel is doing there is a very faint version of the incarnation in Christ. The word becomes flesh. And the word becomes flesh amongst us. Say it. Do it. Be the person who says it and does it. So, so what, you, what you forgive on earth will be forgiven in heaven. But I want you to forgive it and tell them they're forgiven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Well, you loose it and it will be loosed. In the name of Jesus Christ, I say to you, stand up and walk. Jesus has not boomed from the sky. And Peter does not heal the lame man. But Jesus wants it said. And in the spirit, the word becomes flesh through us. Say it, do it, and it needs faith. What a thing to prophesy to all those bones. To have faith is to act as if. And God says, are you going to do this? Are you going to speak this word? Will you speak the word to yourself? Will you speak the word in your heart like the psalmist does to his soul? Will you speak that word of God into your heart? Will you speak that word of God into your relationships? Will we speak the word of God into this community? That he will speak and he will act. Finally, they all stood up, a great big army. Easy to miss that. When we were on holiday, they were being on this beach, fortunately briefly, but anyway, was on this beach by the Mediterranean, and it was full of life. It was full of life. There was children jumping in and out of the sea. There was people walking along. There was people eating. There was people marinating themselves on sort of... Oh, it was all there. This stuff you shouldn't have seen and stuff you did want to see. And it was amazing stuff. It was all life. You know, and it was fun and it was sunny and it was holiday and it was the Mediterranean. And you could, I mean, there was no dry bones there at all. But you look at this, this vision. The vision does not say, I want to bring you life and holidays and lying by the sea. They arose a mighty army. And when I see that, I think, mm, well, perhaps we'll do the beach after all. Because the vision is that we are saved to a purpose. And that army is going to march away, only it's going to march where it's supposed to march and fight a battle that it's going to win. And so you and I are saved to a purpose. It's not just that God doesn't like dry bones, but God needs things done. And so this morning you say, Lord, in my own personal life, in our corporate life, in our life in this church, in this community, we are called to be restored to a purpose. Which could be tough and could be challenging, but in which God will lead us in his way to his place to fight the right battle at the right time in the right place and to win.